You're listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners, with our featured conversation with Richard Tubb and Adam Nash of WebRoot. My name is Jeff Nicholson, and this podcast is all about helping you grow your IT business. In this episode, Richard talks to Adam Nash, sales manager EMEA of WebRoot, a next generation cloud based cybersecurity company. Adam and Richard discussed the importance of cybersecurity, modern malware risks, cloud based security solutions, and what WebRoot can offer MSPs. This episode was recorded via a video call between Richard at home in Newcastle upon Tyne, England, and Adam at WebRoot's head office in Colorado, America. And now, without further ado, here's Richard Tubb talking to Adam Nash. Hi, everyone. Richard Tubb here. And today I'm speaking with Adam Nash of WebRoot. Now, Adam is the sales manager, EMEA, that's European, Middle Eastern, and uh, Asia. He's the sales manager at WebRoot there. And WebRoot is a next generation cloud-based cybersecurity company based out of Colorado in the USA. They've got operations globally though, in Australia, Japan, Europe, and the UK. And personally, I can remember WebRoot way back in the late 1990s with a product called WebRoot Windows Washer, and a little bit later, WebRoot Spy Sweeper. Um, things have clearly come a long way since then. Adam, thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Thanks ever so much for having me, Richard. Um, morning, everyone. Yeah, definitely. WebRoot's evolved over, over the past kind of five to 10 years to be a, a cloud-first security provider. So I think first and foremost, we're, we're a threat intelligence provider, and some of that that finds its way into some of the bigger names um, of, of the IT industry and into some of their hardware. Um, but we also use this threat intelligence for our own platform and to back up our, our kind of business-led solutions. I think our strategic focus is, is MSPs, and, and that, that's some, somewhere where we've been really successful over the kind of past three to four years in, in delivering security services to, to MSPs that allow them to I suppose, make life a little bit easier for themselves, reduce administration, uh, obviously optimize their, their customers' IT environment and, and, and improve efficacy as well. So they're, they're I suppose, the, the core tenets of, of the WebRoot approach. Yeah. Now, I know you've got WebRoot, have got a consumer-facing division as well, where you help protect home yeah. PCs, Macs, and networks. But if it's okay today, as you've mentioned, I'd like to focus on the business uh, side of WebRoot solutions, specifically sure. the managed service provider program. Uh, so you know, in a nutshell, tell us how do you help MSPs to keep their clients safe in what is... Uh, to paraphrase, an increasingly unsafe cyber world. Yeah, it's, um, obviously, we, we provide, I suppose our platform is, is is three solutions that are integrated into one platform. And and the idea behind the, the three solutions and their focus is to try and secure the the endpoint, so the computer, the server, and then the network with, with you know, DNS-based web filtering, and then securing the human, which is, uh, I suppose, the, the, the third element there and probably the most risky element, is, is that 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 user that, that can click on a link or, or visit a website that, that that perhaps they shouldn't be visiting? So, our three solutions are antivirus um, managed straight from the cloud using just cloud intelligence to, to allow us to make detections, and then DNS-based web filtering that filters based on categories um, and, and allows you to stop your users from wasting time, you know, visiting social media websites during during when they're, they're, they're working hours. And then that that security awareness training is, is primarily. I suppose phishing simulation and trying to dupe those users into into making a false move and clicking on a link that they shouldn't do, and then delivering training in a targeted way to those users that, that have accidentally fallen foul of a, of some kind of phishing campaign. And increasingly now, malware is becoming more advanced. It's it's it, it, it's able to evade detection. It's able to to find its way into the network through a variety of different means. And so, what you really need to be doing is is, is trying to to help your users spot something that may not even be suspicious, but just just to raise awareness levels. I think increasingly with the GDPR and things like that on the horizon, making sure that your users is trained is, is almost becoming a legal um, requirement. 
Mm, absolutely. Now, you've touched on two areas that I really want to dig deep into in our conversation today. Uh, the technology, yeah. we'll, we'll dig on, we'll uh, get into that a little bit later. Also, the human element, which I definitely, definitely want to get into because the uh, the target focus of, uh, of this uh, blog and podcast is MSPs. And I know MSPs, wow. if they could just get rid of employees and clients, I think their businesses would run absolutely fine. So let's talk about that a little <laughs> more bit more. Than likely, but, yeah. but before we, we get going with that... Um, I want to touch upon this. So I think in a short period of time, Webroot have become, um, you know, the sort of the name that's synonymous with managed service provider and cybersecurity. In fact, I'd, I'd go as far to say most of the very progressive MSPs that I've personally worked with are using Webroot. In fact, I can remember speaking to some of my former colleagues, at, uh, HTG peer groups, um, some of the biggest MSPs in the world. And when they first became aware of Webroot, they were, they were sort of blown away by the innovative nature of the product. Why would you say, Adam, that Webroot has become that number one choice of the world's uh, top MSPs? I think, I mean, antivirus is boring. Let's face it. I mean, uh, who, who really wants to, to spend many, many hours a day managing antivirus, making sure definitions are up to date? Um, I think the reason that MSPs have chosen us is because our solution is really, really easy to implement. Um, I mean, inherently, you know, people don't choose a, an AV solution that isn't effective. I think our efficacy rates are really, really strong. And most of our customers tell us when they move to Webroot, they see a drastic reduction in the number of viruses. But I think the, 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 the first and foremost is, is MSPs want to spend less time managing things that they feel should be automated. And we do a good job of, of protecting and detecting and remediating without a great deal of internet intervention from the customer, from the MSP. So I think that reducing the total cost of ownership, a lot of companies talk about that when they're talking about their software solutions. But... We do believe you know, that the, the stats speak for themselves. Most of our customers tell us they spend 70 to 80 percent less time managing AV when they when they move to Webroot. I think efficacy should be expected as as as, as a given, right? You don't choose a solution that doesn't work. I think efficacy is really strong for us, uh, and also the products light and fast. So there, there's an added benefit that their customers generally tend to be happier because when they implement Webroot, normally their machines run a lot faster. And in the 21st century, most most IT is pretty fast and responsive, but even even in today's kind of enhanced IT environment, Webroot can still improve the performance of your endpoint. So happier customers, happier support team, better 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 efficiencies. I think they're they're probably the reasons that MSPs choose us. Nice. So I think one of the things that jumps out about Webroot to me in the modern world of MSPs, integration is absolutely key. And most of the MSPs I know uh, build a stack of products and solutions that they offer. And of course, all of those yeah. products and solutions, they need to talk to one another. Um, so tell me more about Webroot's approach towards integration. And specifically, I know you've got something there called the Unity uh, API that helps MSPs sort of go deep. Tell us a bit more about the uh, integration approach with other tools. Yeah, so I think... We recognise that, that that we're we're a solution, we're an add-on. We're not probably the, the the solution that an MSP uses to to manage their business. That's going to be an RMM and a PSA, and so our integrations with those RMMs and, and PSAs is, is key to our success. Um, we work with with the big players in the industry, Autotask, Connectwise, um, Autotask obviously is now Datto, Connectwise, um, Kaseya, Continuum. Um, Ninja, Atera, there's a lot of integrations. I think the only partner we don't really work with is SolarWinds MSP. So I think we're integrated into a lot of the, the RMMs out there, which makes it easier for an MSP to, to manage everything from one pane of glass. And then the, the Unity API itself does give some flexibility outside of an RMM if, if, a, if an MSP has technical staff that can code and, and are familiar with the RESTful API. With the Unity API, you can deploy, you can configure, you can report, you can manage. Um, so it, it, it pretty much most of the things that you can do within Webroot, you can do through the API. So if you've got a keen coder, um, you can take data from the portal and, and create your own kind of dashboard of, of, of what's happening within the Webroot world within your organization. But you can also get Webroot to do things, change policies, deploy clients, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it just gives those MSPs some flexibility. If they're not using an RMM or they want some additional kind of bespoke integration work into their ticketing system or into into other systems within the business and they can use the unity api to achieve that mm, cool now, i want to go back to something you touched upon earlier on and that's like total cost of ownership um 
Mm. All these tools that we talk about now, including WebRoot, they cost MSPs money. Um, one of the mm. arguments that I hear from MSPs when they speak to their clients is that they either can't or won't pay for any more cybersecurity. Uh, how do you, um, dare I say, coach MSPs on how to educate their clients on why solutions like WebRoot are absolutely essential nowadays? I mean, that's, that, that's a very important point, and I'm glad you touched on it. I, I think it's it's a software solutions provider's job to arm an MSP with positioning arguments for their customers. I mean, at the end of the day, we we should know how to position our solutions to different types of customers, be they MSP or, or end user. And an MSP kind of strongly aligns themselves with that Im- improved security, reduced infections message that, that, that you know all of our solutions lend themselves well to. But... How that MSP then takes that that message and communicates it to its to their customers is really really important. So um, for things like DNS based filtering, you know, we we can tell an MSP, hey, you're going to drastically reduce the, the the number of threats that make it onto your network in the first place. And a customer says, I don't care. That's your job, Mr. MSP. And so you know, we need to arm the MSP with with positioning arguments around productivity improvements because a business owner very much understands why getting an extra fifteen percent. Of, of working time out of their staff, it's going to impact their bottom line. And so how we position to the MSP to allow them to, to, to showcase, you know, the, the strengths of a solution to their customers is, is key. In things like security awareness training, again, it's important for the MSP to understand, you know, why an end user would need to be trained uh, around security. And, and talking about downtime, you know, positioning something like security awareness training to a, to a company and saying, look, if, if one of your team members clicked on a URL that, that, launched a virus that couldn't be stopped by your by your antivirus or did something unusual that opened the back door for someone to get onto your network and that brought your network down or, or some of your machines on your network down, what would that cost the business? You know, how, how much does it cost when your business goes offline? Um, so yeah, giving, giving MSPs positioning arguments to talk to their customers about the solutions that you're selling, I think it's really important because otherwise they're, they're not going to spend loads of time working out how to position a new solution to their customers. Mm, understood. Uh, and I want to dig deeper a little bit on one of your previous roles at WebRoot. You used to look after the uh, partners, didn't you, as a channel manager there? What mm. makes a good partner for you for WebRoot? Um, I mean, I think it's probably the same as, as in any, any industry, really. You know, a partnership is about two people working towards a common goal. And so someone that's properly engaged someone that wants to, to take your messaging and go out to their customers, someone that wants to interact with you and with the sales team, with the marketing team, with the support teams, that, that, that's great, you know, because at the end of the day, it, it's not a partnership if you're not working towards like a common goal. So it, that, that level of interaction is great. And I hope that, that we give a responsive, you know, commercial, but also marketing and support experience to our customers. We won SC Magazine's best support for the second year in a row. And I think that's because we do try to take a more, engaged approach with, with, with our customers. You know, I always say to anyone that I'm speaking to, if you've ever got a problem, let me know. And I, and I, and I want to try and help you fix it. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you need to provide a, a little bit more than, than, than your, than your competition is, is providing. And that kind of, that, 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 that more personal touch to support or to commercial or to marketing, I think is, is what an MSP is looking for as well, if I'm honest. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so I've held off a little bit. So the geeky part of me is absolutely dying to talk about some of the tech here. So with your permission, Adam, I'll jump into that. Um, sure. WebRoot talks about cloud-based security. Um, in practical terms, how does that differ from the traditional, dare I say, agent-based sort of antivirus solutions that many of us, particularly people like me, have been in the IT industry for a long time, are familiar with. Uh, what does the cloud-based security look like that's different? I mean, it, it is such a rapidly changing threat landscape that, you know, being able to, to, to store all of the intel around new threats as they happen in, in one central source and then drawing upon that um, for, for all of your customers, it has to be a better approach because the quantity of new pieces of malware we see just, just in a Windows environment, you know, it's, it's like 200 million a year, um, maybe more than that. And so creating definitions and rule sets to, to detect those that you then download locally to a machine is, is probably not going to be the most effective way of, of protecting your customers. Um, 
yes, I mean, I think one central repository that, that's constantly being feeded by, sorry, being fed by agents um, around the world. So everyone using WebRoot reinforces WebRoot um, in the same way as they draw upon the intelligence that, that, that's present there in the cloud. So I think it's just, it, it's a common sense approach. Um, but our, our technology, sl- I mean, I, I suppose everyone says this, and I, I, I'm not trying to say that, that, that we're as unique and that there are other AV providers that, that offer some of the, the components that we offer. But our approach is, is, is around preventing any type of malware virus worm from running on your machine um, and from affecting the way that the machine operates. But we, we're not so bothered about detecting something for detection's sake unless it's going to impact the, the operating system negatively. So we don't scan every folder on the, on the computer. We look in specific folders to see whether or not there, there is any malware that could be loaded into memory, and we, we scan when things get loaded into memory from, from scripts or from websites. And we also scan when, when things get recorded to disk, because at that point, that, that's really when, when something could happen. Um, so our, our approach is, is slightly different. We're not scanning the whole hard disk to look to see if we can find something suspicious. We're, we're looking to see what could affect you, the user, or, or the operating system. Mm. So it's a slightly different approach. But yeah, cloud first, absolutely, it has to be because that's the only way of keeping keeping up to speed with, with the, the growing cyber criminal industry. I mean, it's, it's an industry, right? And more money's made from cyber crime now than traditional methods of fraud and, and, and extortion. And so you know, it, inevitably cyber criminals are, are becoming more innovative, more clever because the rewards are, are bigger and bigger year on year. I think it's more than $5 billion dollars was generated using ransomware in, in 2017 to 2018, potentially that could double. So, I mean, it's, it's very much a lucrative environment. So, you know, cybersecurity companies have got to try and stay out of the game. Mm. Now, I just want to uh, pick up on something you said earlier, Ron. You've mentioned DNS protection a couple of times. Um, it's a service mm. I see many of the more progressive MSPs offering. Um, so it seems cybersecurity has evolved from an antivirus agent installed on a computer to a multi-tiered, multifaceted approach. Where does DNS protection yeah. and, and how does all this fit together? Yeah, good question. I think we've always advocated a multi-layered event, uh, approach to securing your endpoints because viruses find their way into networks from, from so many different locations and, and, and vectors that actually, you know, if, if you haven't patched your operating system um, with the latest updates, then even if you've got the world's best antivirus, it, it may sometimes struggle to, to stop an exploit from being you know, leveraged within an environment. Um, if, if you're not taking backups, I mean, there, 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 there's quite a few things that we talk about when it comes to a kind of structured approach or, or a layered approach to security. Making sure that you've got a good endpoint technology is important, backing up your data so that if worse comes to worst, um, you know, you, you've always got a, a, a backup. <laughs> um, user education, um, you know, making sure that users are aware of, of, of what threats are out there and what potentially could go wrong by clicking on links or, or opening emails or attachments. Disabling the execution of script files on on the network, I think that that that's a great way to stop random scripts from running within your environment and, and potentially loading malware onto the system or calling out to to malicious websites. Um, making sure that you update your software. I mean, it sounds like a a, a very um, old fashioned thing to to talk about, but patching still as relevant now as it was twenty years ago. I want to cry happened and was such a big problem because people hadn't patched their systems three months after the patch had been released. So so making sure that you patch not just Windows, but other things like Java, or Adobe, um, other third party applications is key because they, they inevitably will have exploits that can be leveraged. Um, making sure that, that passwords are strong, making sure that RDP is, is locked down. Um, we see a lot of RDP breaches where, where people are putting public facing IP addresses to for, for, for RDP machines um, and, and, and then using potentially not, not necessarily very, very strong passwords. So that, 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 that's a great way into a network. And once you've compromised an RDP server, you've potentially got domain access and domain credentials. So there, there, there's a few different ways to, to, to protect your, your network. Filtering traffic at the network level as, as, as well is, is, is kind of key because if you can stop all devices, not just Windows machines, but, but any other device with an IP address that's communicating out into the world, um, if, if you can stop them from going to malicious IPs or malicious URLs, then, then again, that's 
inevitably going to make your your environment more secure. So, so putting some kind of network filtering in place is is, is going to reduce that that risk mm. window. Now, back in 2010, I know WebRoot acquired BrightCloud, uh, web reputation and content classification technology. When you and I have spoken and when I've seen you present, BrightCloud seems to be a huge part of uh, WebRoot's sort of cloud-first approach. Um, what is BrightCloud? And, and you've also talked about um, network anomaly detection and things like that. Uh, you know, how does that all work nowadays? Yeah, so, so BrightCloud is is our our cloud Intel that that we use for our business solutions, so that the AV, the security awareness training, and the the DNS based filtering, but also that's the, the the technology that we white label into other vendor solutions, people like Cisco, Palo Alto, F5. They use some of that that content classification, that URL classification, to allow them to route traffic safely. Um, and yeah, in, inevitably. As a cloud-first company, that that's probably our most valuable asset and, and our most prized asset. Because I think the reason that some of these bigger technology players choose to work with WebRoot is probably because we've got a broad customer base and what we're seeing quite a lot of data. And, and, and we're also working with some of the bigger names in, in the industry. So maybe maybe they take they take some comfort from that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a very very important part of, of the portfolio. Um, something that, that that we kind of make available to to, to partners that want to take that data and, and and use our threat intelligence to correlate against alerts that they're seeing, for example, for a scene. Um, solutions like Logarithm, we we integrate with to to give you detections um, around the, the things that you're seeing in, in an alert. Um, but inevitably, as, as I kind of touched on this earlier, as, as that threat landscape evolves ever further and 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 it becomes increasingly challenging to to stop attacks as they come in from from a myriad of different vectors being able to understand what what anomalous behavior looks like um we, we realized was really really important for that that iot space because actually you're, you're no longer looking at an operating system to see whether or not something malicious is running on that operating system you're, you're looking to see whether or not maybe a call out from a specific machine at a specific time of the day to a specific location could be deemed to be unusual and if so how do you then put in place some kind of action to, to block that traffic or, or start to investigate that traffic? And so that's why we acquired um, the company Cyberflow in, in 2016, because that, that gave us that, that anomaly detection capability that, that we could then plug into our, our threat intelligence and kind of link the two together and, and hopefully provide a, a more robust um, solution for, for MSP. So that, that's something that we're working on integrating into the portfolio over the, over the coming months. Hmm. Now, I want to return to tech in a little bit, but I'm conscious mm -hmm. that one of the massive uh, vectors um, for, for cybersecurity uh, for hackers to get in is humans. It's probably fair to say that humans are the weakest link in any cyber defense uh, policy. Yeah. Uh, end users, especially for MSPs. How, Adam, can MSPs help their clients become more aware of cybersecurity? Because it, it, is it probably fair to say that even with the best tools in the world, you know, if somebody clicks on a link um, that uneducated about, you know, there's only so much that an MSP can do to actually protect their clients, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's, it's more about improving the vigilance of, of of the staff. I mean, increasingly these days, phishing attacks are so good that, you know, I, I've been fooled. I know techie guys in our in our business have been fooled by what looks like a, a, a absolutely a totally legitimate uh, email. Um, one, one of my colleagues talks about buying a, a fire online from, from someone um, and then he received a bill through um, from that very same that very same website, and it, it, it had a PDF attachment. So he's, he's kind of expecting this bill to arrive. Click on the link. It, it starts asking him for his Gmail credentials. None of this is unusual, but he, he realized that at that point the, the, the domain was being spoofed, and actually he, he was being led down the garden path a little bit. But it, it, it's increasingly difficult with, with things like you know hacked um, security certificates. It, it, it's quite easy to, to make even a phishing website look legitimate, uh, and these days, there, there are far fewer typos in those in those phishing mm -hmm. emails than, than we used to see. There's, there's fewer African princes trying to free up funds from from bank accounts. It, it's more it's more professionally done. It's it, it's more targeted. But even going back to the African prince analogy, that 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 is a scam that's designed to 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 to, to get the weakest, really, because it it it, it requires someone that's, that's relatively gullible to respond to the email. 
but someone that is at least computer literate and knows how to send emails. I mean, it, it, different attacks are, are, are targeted at different types of people. Um, social engineering is something that we're seeing a lot of lately, which is very, very difficult to train against. When someone calls you up and says, hey, um, I'm calling on behalf of your MD, um, he's asked me to give you a call and, and, and you, you need to pay this bill, or you receive an email through saying, hey, can you change the, the bank account that we've got registered on file? And so you make the change um, because you see an email come through from a legitimate email address on, headed, on a headed email, and you make a change, and then the next payment you make to that, that organization goes out of the country and disappears forever. It's, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to, to vet you know, good communications, good websites. So I think user awareness and, and just making people just have that little bit more cautious before they do anything that, that's unusual or that's non-standard is, is, is important. Mm. And security awareness training kind of hopefully does that. So in practical terms, Adam, how would you recommend the web group partners, MSPs in general, get started with that security awareness training for their clients? Um, I mean, I think GDPR is probably a good talking point to start off with. Legally, businesses are expected to understand the regulation, are expected to, to train their staff on what GDPR means for the business. And so using a security awareness training program, you can you can provide that training to your staff. So I mean, that, that that's a good starting point if, if you needed a justification. Um, I think having a play with it, seeing what it looks like, testing it out on a customer, you can do that free of charge. And nine times out of 10, the customer will say, wow, that was good, I like that. And I, I can see why this could be valuable for my business because most you, you will see that you know 30 to 40 percent of users will click on a phishing link on that first pass um, on that first phishing email that you send out. I think that that's quite enlightening for a business because they, they realize how risky their, their, their staff are at that point. Um, so yeah getting it getting it testing it with a customer is probably the best way to to, to show value to those customers. Um, but yeah equally there's a GDPR positioning message as well. Mm, um, yeah, that's, that's something that's important. That absolutely makes sense. And I think a lot of um, MSPs that I'm speaking to are getting inbound inquiries now about security um, from small businesses because of GDPR. You know, GDPR is, is helping raise the bar a little bit. So that's an interesting one, yeah. Now, yeah. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper with the tech talk because I'm a geek, as you know, Adam, and I love it. Um, <laughs> earlier this year, for instance, we had a lot of panic around the spectre of vulnerability. Um, you've already mentioned exploits during our conversation here. For, yeah. for the uninitiated, what would you say as an expert is the difference between a vulnerability, an exploit, say malware, and a virus? Run us through you know, the basic sort of technology phrases there. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, a vulnerability in computer security is, is a weakness that can be exploited by someone um, to do something within your environment. So, a vulnerability could be an unpatched server that allows someone to use an exploit to get into to, to your network. So they, they could potentially use some kind of um, code that, that allows them to overpower the operating system because the operating system hasn't been patched and there's a bug within it. So that, that bug is the vulnerability that needs to be patched. Otherwise an exploit can be, can be leveraged to get into the network. Um, and so yeah, exploits are code or um, mechanisms by which you can take advantage of vulnerabilities in software. Um, so the two, I suppose, are, are quite closely linked. Mm. Um, in, in terms of, I mean, we, in the industry, we tend to talk about malware, and malware is basically anything. It's, I mean, it's bad, badware, bad applications. Um, it, it's, it's probably a virus of some description, or it, it, it's an, an application that, that has a malicious intent at heart. Um, a virus is... Is, is 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 malware? Malware is viruses, effectively. But a virus, in theory, is 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 something that's self-replicating and that can move across the network. Um, it's it's designed to to. And then what we're seeing now is is, is definitely a, a move back to to incorporating worm-like capabilities into viruses. So worms were designed to move across the network with without any. Um, without any assistance, and as we saw with things like WannaCry, that that had a worm element that allowed it to to carry on infecting systems. For some reason, 
worms were, were became old fashioned and old hat for for a couple of years, but now they're back with a vengeance, and they they seem to to to, to be a great way of, of of making sure that a virus has it has its has its proper impact. So that the worm like capability is that that searching through the network for, for other devices that, that have the vulnerability and then trying to move across to those devices and and then infect further um, using using the virus, yeah. um, which may, may be trying to encrypt files or, or what have you. Mm. Um, and, and that's why the threat intelligence is so important from your perspective, because these things are changing so quickly. It's not like the old days, is it, where you can just have like a, a template or a, a, an ID file go out to agents that says, hey, this is what a virus looks like. Um, you know, detect it and, and, and protect against it nowadays. They're, they're morphing yeah. all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think polymorphism is is the norm. And for those that don't know what that means, it, it just means that uh, a virus can change and have different attributes dependent upon what operating system it's running on, what time of day it is, what other applications are installed, what language the operating system is in. That polymorphism means that, that it changes each time that it runs dependent upon the environment that it's running in. So that makes it quite hard to track quite hard to stop because it might do something different if it installed on a, on a Spanish operating system to, to, to being installed in an English operating system, for example. Um, but yeah, increasingly, I mean, viruses are designed to evade capture and that, that's the only way they, they work in the wild because they, 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 need to, they need to exist and they, they need to be able to work somewhere. Otherwise, yeah, it, it, so, so that the, the cyber criminals are increasingly using loads of new techniques to beat antivirus things like process hollowing which we see quite a lot, which is where um, a virus will take advantage of a good process and then use that good process to do things within the, the operating system. It's quite difficult to, to evade. Um, fileless malware, which is which is not using portable executables, which is typically how we see um, viruses being executed within an environment. They, they use an EXE or some kind of other executable file to, to run malicious code, whereas fileless malware is, is often stored in a registry key and just loaded into memory and and, and May, may attempt to run a script or, or something like that. Um, so again, yeah, there, there are various things that you can do to lock down your environment, as we kind of touched on previously. I think if you can try and put in place things like you know preventing scripts from from running, um, making sure you've got a decent antivirus web filtering solution, making sure that you've if you've backed up your data, then even if a, a new technique is used within your environment, in theory, you've locked down your your environment to, to such an extent that that it won't be able to harm your machines. Hmm. So on one hand, we hear a lot about uh, the dark web and script kiddies and things like this. It's, it's actually really quite easy for anybody, even without technical knowledge now, you know, to go on the dark web, to buy uh, tools and information that allow them uh, to make these uh, cyber attacks. So, so that's there. And you probably see that every single day. On the flip side of the coin, yeah. though, I'm, I'm intrigued, Adam. What's the most bizarre intrusion you've come across yourself, or or perhaps one that, dare I say, you've even had a bit of grudging admiration for because it's a bit innovative? Yeah, geez, I, we we see. I mean, it's not even this innovative. I, I just always find it it quite crazy how easy it is to perform social engineering to to effectively extort money out of businesses. We hear it all the time from our MSPs. Is is you know someone called up and said that they they needed they needed us to pay a bill, so we paid it. <laughs> and you're like, well, okay, where, where were your checks and balances that said if if a new supplier calls up needing to be paid, we need to find the order that was made. We need to find the goods delivery notice. I mean, there there are some basic checks. It's almost now that that we we rely so much on computers. The you know that that we get we get duped by by something that perhaps isn't related to a computer at all. It's just social engineering. Someone asks us to pay some money, and so we pay it because we we think that that's that's what we should do. That that surprises me quite a lot. Um, it's just the world is increasingly online. I, I find denial of service attacks to be probably the the most worrying. Um, you see some of the biggest websites in the world being taken down by by denial of service attacks. And I, I find it, I find that quite, quite interesting because most of the time they're using computers that, that, that have been hijacked and that are part of a botnet to send data through to a specific website or a specific um, online service. But they're also increasingly using IoT devices. So I think one of the, the big outages um, caused by a DDoS attack in, in the last few months was, was where um, 
remote cameras were used and they, they, were, they were compromised because of a security weakness within the, within the camera's OS. And they were then used to, to fire a load of data at a website. Um, so yeah, I, I find D- DDoS attacks to be, to be quite interesting. Mm. Um, I mean, there, there are some, some good DDoS mitigation services out there that will just take the traffic and, and redirect it somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I, I find that a, 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 an interesting new, new way of extorting money in, mm. in, in the online age. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you've already touched upon it here, and anybody who's playing cybersecurity bingo whilst listening to this, they, they pretty much won the house now. We've talked about the Internet of Things, IoT, um, and we're increasingly hearing more about IP-connected devices, home automation, uh, the Internet of Things. You've mentioned a couple of things there. What are the dangers do you think this new IP-enabled world presents to MSPs? How can they help their clients stay safe? I think I'm understanding what devices a customer's got within their environment and a proper inventory of, of what internet enabled devices exist within a customer's environment is, is key in order to understand what their risk profile looks like. Um, I think just good password best practices for, for, for IOT devices is, is probably a good start. Um, I remember when I first started in IT, which is quite a long time ago, back in the, in the early nineties, um, you, Oracle came provided with with the with the username and password system, and then manager, <laughs> and the amount of people that didn't change that username and password, yeah. it was it was crazy. Government, police, health services would leave, you know, databases with all their information, and the username and password system manager. Uh, but I think that that is still a problem now. Um, new devices get delivered, and I, we we work with um, a company called Pentest Partners, and they're they're very knowledgeable on on IoT devices and, and the risks that, that exist within the IoT world. And they talk about bad security on IoT devices all the time. So I think an MSP could definitely help their customers by running an audit of all the IoT or internet-enabled devices within the customer's network and just making sure that the username and password isn't set to be default mm. um, and that they've got a complex password enabled on those devices and wherever possible, increase the security for those devices so getting them communicating over HTTPS instead of standard HTTP, maybe changing the ports that those devices communicate on so that a script kiddie or someone that, that doesn't necessarily have that much information, but that knows that all of devices of a certain type communicate on a certain IP using a certain port with a certain username and password will be able to compromise those devices. So I think they're probably the, the things that I'd suggest, but I'm, I'm not really a, an expert. I, I just... Uh, as well, yeah. You, you could have fooled me, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, there's a couple of other technologies that I've recently picked up on um, via the Webroot blog. Um, and for anybody who's not, not visited the Webroot blog, if you're interested in cybersecurity, and you should be, given what we've talked about today, um, Webroot have got a really fantastic blog with, with lots of um, good information on there. Could we do just give a quick drive-by almost of a couple of these solutions, uh, Adam? There's two that jump out to me. The first one was the IP reputation service and the second one you've touched upon slightly but it's the streaming malware detection um, can you explain uh-huh. both of those services yeah so I mean effectively the the real-time anti-phishing is is using lots of data points and, and correlating information from from our database um, to, 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 to allow us to make decisions about new websites as they appear um, and so I suppose already having quite a big database of cloud data and, and scanning the IP address space, or the IP4 address space uh, three or four times a day, we're, we're, we're aware of, of what, what exists and, and, and what is, is potentially new. Um, but also we've got a history of, of, of whether or not um, a website has ever been malicious or linked to any, any malicious um, websites. Um, we use... Uh, a technology called maximum entropy discrimination. Which, that flies off the top, um, it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it tries to identify whether or not a specific URL is a phishing site yes. when it's accessed. Um, and it, it effectively is trying to differentiate between lots of different um, specific site features and behaviors to determine whether or not there is a phishing risk on that website. Um, 
and it, it, it it's known to be a little bit more effective than than, than the other mechanisms that, that we've used in the past. Um, so it it, 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 I suppose it, it it's using um, information from from the website in real time to make a decision about whether or not what it's trying to do is is, is malicious. It's it, it's effectively machine learning technology. It's it's. Yeah. In, in the same way as all of the the, the other security providers and, and, and IT companies out there are, are, are trying to leverage AI or machine learning, you, it's not possible for uh, to, to have a team of researchers big enough to make determinations about threats because of the, the vast quantity of threats that we see on a daily basis. And so, um, yeah, using some kind of form of machine learning is, is, is the only way really to deal with the volumes. Mm. Um, so that's the 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 phishing. Um, the the, the real-time phishing um, shield. Um, and you, you asked about the streaming malware detection as well. Yeah, yeah, because you talked earlier on about fileless um, infections and things. So I'm sort of intrigued whether the streaming malware fits into uh, to that category. But, but what is the streaming malware detection? Um, so it's basically... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a service that allows us to identify... Um, and stop obviously malicious files um, using it's, it's using our bright cloud file reputation service mm -hmm. so you, effectively our partners would send us files and we would make determinations about those files and send that determination back to to a customer mm -hmm. um, so it, it it allows you to block known threats whitelists good files um, and then allows us to also I suppose research those unknowns that are coming there yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it, 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 it's it's designed to be a it's it, it's designed to be a service that is consumed by by other technology companies or by kind of larger organisations that that want to 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 analyse the data that they're seeing and, and get a second opinion or, or maybe a first opinion back about whether or not what what they've what they've seen or or, or received is is malicious. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the, the innovations that we're seeing from, from from WebRoot that are sort of you know making you the market leader here. It's the stuff really. I mean, I've asked about them because I'm a massive geek, Adam, and I like to know about these technologies. <laughs> the reality is, um, I think that actually MSPs don't need to know so much about what goes on in the background because you want to give them the confidence that actually the threat landscape is changing and you're the ones who are doing all of the work in the background to make sure that the, the MSPs are, are able to, to keep up really with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the idea and the, the, the ethos behind our, our platforms is in, in theory, they should be very, very easy to manage and we want to take the heavy lifting out of, of, of providing security to to manage customers and I think that's what we've done with, with all of our platforms. It should be quick to set up. The ongoing management and maintenance should be really, really minimal and um, efficacy is, is is obviously that benchmark that, that everyone uses to, to to decide whether or not to keep a solution or to buy a solution. I think our efficacy rates are, are really robust. Mm. Let, let's touch upon one, one final area of, of tech that everybody nowadays is familiar with, uh, mobile. Now, you and I were recently on the road doing a, a tour of the UK with a totally MSP road show. I remember you, you having a smile on your face because I had four devices with me just while I was having a conversation with you. I've got at least another half, half a dozen devices that sit here at home. How important is mobile security? What are WebRoot doing uh, to help with the, the mobile uh, in, in the wider security, cyber security sort of debate? Yes, I mean, we've got a mobile SDK that, that third party technology providers leverage in, in order to, to get reputation analysis on, on new apps. We've got a, a mobile um, security product that, that's designed to run on Android and iOS. Um, I, I mean, I, I personally thought. Um, BYOD was was going to be huge, and it was mm -hmm. going to be, you know, the, the the next the next big growth area for for the tech industry. But it it, it doesn't feel like it has been, um, and I think that's probably down to the fact that the mobile technology providers, Google and and, and Apple, have, have done a good job of of securing their their operating systems, um, whilst Android remains to be less less secure than, than Apple. Um, it, 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 it's made big, big leaps um, forward in terms of the security of the operating system over the last couple of iterations. So um, our, our solutions are, are for, the, for, the, for the Apple devices is, is more of a, a really, really light MDM. So it, it kind of gives you the ability to remote wipe, remote lock, 
your devices. It secures the, the types of communications that you can use on your Apple devices. But it's it's not really an antivirus solution because we don't really see viruses within the Apple space. It's it's rare for us to see a virus running on an Apple. I actually, we've never seen a virus running on an Apple mobile device. Mm. Um, and, and equally, the Mac OS is, has got far fewer um, viruses than, than a traditional um, Windows device. Uh, for the Android, it, it's definitely it's definitely slightly weaker in terms of security aspects. Um, but again, we, we, we have a malware scanner for Android and, and obviously we have those kind of MDM light capabilities, remote wipe, remote lock, screen. Um, so, so that you know, if, if your device is being used by corporate users and it gets lost, you can delete that sensitive data. Um, but there is a malware scanner on the Android device um, or the Android version of WebRoot, WebRoot for mobile. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not something that, that is that popular within our customer base. I think it's essentially because it's slightly harder to manage mm. um, mobile applications if you're not a full MDM, um, which we're not. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, a, it, it's an area for growth for, for us, definitely. Mm. So I'm very conscious of your time. I know how busy you are, uh, dashing all over the place. I know a few people who do as much traveling as you, in fact, so uh, conscious of time. Having listened to this episode today, what is the one action that you would like to see MSPs take as a result of what they've heard? Um, I, I love a dialogue. I mean, uh, we, we love talking to MSPs. We like hearing what what they see in terms of trends, what 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 their pains are, what their successes have been, so that we can learn from from the MSP community. Um, I'd love to think that if you're not using Webroot, you might you might give it a try. Um, it, it's so easy to, to set up that running a proof of concept takes you know less than five minutes to get set up. If you're already using Webroot, take a look at our new solutions, the, the DNS-based filtering and security awareness training solution. I think add some, some interesting new revenue streams to an MSP's portfolio. And I think with the right positioning, you, you can definitely get customers to buy into these technologies because I don't think they, they add a, an extra layer of, of, of security, but also they allow customers from a DNS perspective to, to reduce you know, time waste and improve, improve productivity for end users. And, and that security awareness training does, does ready the, the business end users for GDPR as well to a certain extent. So, yeah. 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 Definitely worth checking out. Uh, what we'll do, we'll include all of the resources we've talked about today because we've talked about an awful lot. We'll make sure they're included in the show notes. But before we go, Adam, if anybody wants to reach out to you directly, how would they find you? Oh, my email address is anash at webroot.com. Adam, so my name's Adam Nash. It's anash at webroot.com. Drop me an email. Fantastic. Adam, appreciate your time today. I have thrown a ton of stuff at you and you've answered it all absolutely flawlessly. <laughs> I know you said you're not a techie. Thanks, but you, you certainly give the impression that you know what you're talking about. So uh, <laughs> appre appreciate the time. And um, I look forward to hopefully seeing you on the, the road sometime again uh, very, very soon. Yeah, likewise, I look forward to that. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners. You can find the show notes and bonus content for this interview, along with dozens of other interviews with IT business leaders over at www.tubblog.co.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, then we'd really appreciate you rating and reviewing the show over at iTunes. Every review helps us reach new listeners and helps raise the bar for success in the IT industry. In our next episode, Richard speaks with Rob Ray to discuss the merger between Datto and Autotask. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next episode. Have a great week. Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my diary 
diary of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's gogo.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.